Well, I've been having a few troubles with the heating at this property. Uh, basically, radiators have been shutting down temperature I can't set. So what I've decided to do is do a full radiator system flush. So that's going to involve removing each of these radiators in the house. There are seven in total. And flushing them out individually. But before I start... And we've located the drain point here and we've got a length of hose pipe and I'll just drain this down. And the boiler's losing pressure like billy -o, so the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll switch it off. And I've actually put the hose through the letterbox. Um, just so we can shut the door and keep the house a little warmer while we're doing this. And that's draining quite nicely. So while that's draining, I'm going to take the opportunity to flush the boiler out. So I'm just going to, it's obviously going to be different depending on what boiler you have. I'm just going to put it in fill mode and just run a bit of water through it. So we've got a, a clear way out. So that should flush any... Uh, residue deposits out from the boiler keeping that nice and clean so I'll go into the reason as to why I'm choosing to remove every radiator individually in this property it's got uh, drop legs or that's what I call them anyway where the floors are concrete so we have a, a radiator upstairs drops down there's a flow and return for this and it goes back up again. If you've got wooden floors, it will be configured more than likely differently. So it's very difficult to actually set a flush up to clear the full system. There should actually be a drain point here, I'm led to believe, but there isn't one. So I've got three of these to contend with in this property as it's got concrete floors. So I'm going to start with the upper floor radiator nearest the boiler. We've got a TRV on this side, so I'm just going to turn that off. And we have the lock shield valve. Um, sometimes you may have a plastic cap on this, sometimes not, but this basically sets the the balance in. The, you'll find it near the boiler, it could be anything from a quarter of a turn. Um, and furthest away, a full turn. It basically just sets the amount of heat for each radiator. So if we're going to turn this and do make a note of how far you turn it, you know, you could maybe use a clock system because uh, if you want to put things back exactly how they were, you can, you can then uh, refer to your notes. So we've got some adjustable grips there and we're going to go in an upward direction and we just want to use the swan neck pliers just to grip the fitting we don't want to be putting any forces into the pipe work and kinking it so we're now we'll just slacken that off see what comes I've got a few things at my disposal to catch the drips. We've got an oven tray there and I've got some foil trays which are quite good. I've also got a jug there. That, uh, the foil trays are particularly like because you can distort them into shape. And we've got a bucket just in case uh, as foil trays fill up we can quickly decant them into the bucket. It always pays to have more than one um, because you don't want to end up in a situation where you've filled one up and there's nowhere to go and you're stuck here. And we've got the oven tray at the bottom to catch the water while we're switching. And there it is. So with that draining, we can get his bucket and everything ready for a quick switch. Hopefully you can see the water's got a little darker as we've drained some of the radiator down. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my bleed key 
We're going to need one radiator bleed key. We just want to introduce some air into this. As the air goes in, the water goes out. So with that side just dripping away and we've collected a good amount of water, we'll then treat this side to the same procedure. And we are moving in a downward direction with the wrench. I am going to open the taps at this stage. Um, the theory being the more air we introduce, the less draining we'll have to do. So now we're at the delicate stage of removal, so we just lift the radiator up. But there is a little problem to worry about, and that is dripping discoloured water on your carpet. So you can either try and plug both ends of it with your fingers, and you're going to need an unobstructed exit to the outside world, or we can stuff a bit of cloth in them just to prevent any dribbles. So I picked the radiator up off the wall and this is what came out of it. I tipped it straight in the bucket. And then I carefully went downstairs with it, taking care not to drip too much of this on the floor because we're letting air in to the system through them radiator pipes. We've now got a steady trickle of water, which we didn't have before. So that should make life a little easier when we get to the other radiators. So we've now got the radiator set up straight to the garden tap. Um, the side to the right, we just managed to secure it with a 13 to 20 mil Jubilee clip. And then at the left, we've used a plumbing fitting, namely an isolating valve. That's one thing you can do. And that's gone straight onto the half PSP fitting. Some radiator fittings may be larger than that. Three quarter BSP is uh, a popular fitting. So you may have to knock something up in order to do this. And then we've got it draining straight into a bucket. And we've got it so we can reverse the flow at any given time just to get the most out of it or attempt to. So with the isolator valve in the closed position and the bleed key closed, we'll apply some pressure into the radiator. So we heard it gurgling just then. So we are actually compressing air at this point in the radiator. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to undo the bleed with a screwdriver and and hopefully you can see some lovely black deposits escape. So even with the isolator valve closed, the pressure is so great, we're getting some black gunge out and we'll just let it go. So we can repeatedly build the pressure up and then release it. I'm going to keep doing that till the water clears up. So pulsing can make a difference. Varying the flow of the water helps get rid of the deposits. Need something you can quickly do it with. So, isolation valve, washing machine, tap, that kind of thing. Quarter of a turn, and I've done it. So I'm gonna work with that, and when it gets to the stage where it, it makes little difference, we're gonna try the next stage. So we've now reached the stage where the water's flowing lovely and clear. So I have a, a rubber hammer here. I'd recommend you use a rubber one. And I just want to hit the bottom of the radiator. So with every little blow, I can get 
a bit more discoloration out. So I've now reached the stage where tapping the radiator isn't making any difference. We're still flowing lovely and clear. So we've flipped the radiator and we'll let that go. And that made a bit of difference. So we'll keep working that until that runs clear. So we'll now try a very precarious position just to see the result. So I've gave the radiator a good few taps and we'll let the valve go. Slight discoloration. You can see we're winning slowly. Uh, the object of this video is to find out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I've got a bit of black out there. Seems to be a bit of a rhythm to it. Off, on, off, on. So the next thing to try is reversing the flow. Yeah, it still works. It's quite a bit of discoloration coming out. There's also alarming black lumps. So that could explain why we're having trouble with this heating system. It's going to be worthwhile giving this a very thorough clean. Well, after giving the radiator a very thorough tapping, we've managed to liberate quite a lot of this stuff. So I can definitely see why I was struggling to balance the heating because we've got all this gunge floating around and it's going to be skilled in blocking pipes and impeding the circulation of the central heating system. I've spent quite a bit of time rocking the radiator like this and we still get bits of black stuff out so I'm going to continue with this. So that one's all finished now, clear water no matter whatever I do and no more black chunks. So we'll get that one refitted so it's one down and six to go. And this is the foil tray principle in action. You're doing a good job of just automatically bailing. So we've distorted the tray so it's catching every drop of water. Well, I'm on the second one now, and one thing I've just thought of, you see here we use the isolator valve. It does reduce the pipe diameter down from 15mm quite considerably. So it may pay just to do a flush. As I found out, I've got some quite large chunks out of this radiator, just with no hose on whatsoever. And that way anything what's large isn't going to be restricted by the inner dimensions of any fittings you use. I'm just in the process of draining rad number three upstairs and uh, you can see the black deposits that are coming out of it just at the draining stage. So and when I opened up the valve, the bleed valve, it actually got even worse. Let's try it again. You can see it just keeps flowing out and circulating. Well that radio it took forever. Uh, I think it's a bad sign if you're seeing that much when you're draining it down. Out of all the hammer taps I've done, uh, I've done quite a few in the centre. All around it really, the most productive ones have been right at the end. And logically there is a reason for that, because that's where the, the plumbing enters. So if there's anything big, it, it doesn't really want to travel too far around the radiator. One thing I am wondering before I refit this radiator is, was the world a better place when wallpaper like this was in vogue? So I've now jumped to radiator 7 and I'm hoping this one's going to be pretty clean because uh, I did flush it a few weeks back. You can see the the black liquid that's came out the other radiators so far because every time I take one off the wall I pour it in here. Well, that's radiator number 7 back in place and before I do anything, I'm going to go around with a bleed key and just check that everything's all nice and tight. Uh, I don't want to be applying pressure at the boiler end and there could be a radiator in a quiet room just oozing water everywhere. So I'm now going to lock off the drain prior to refilling. And I've now got the boiler refilling. So it's going to be different, it depends what boiler you've got. Hopefully I'll build 
a little pressure up in this soon. Uh, in the meantime, I think I'll just walk around, just checking for leaks or anything obvious. I've uh, been round, found a couple of leaks, nipped them up. It's mainly the pipes down here. I'll just go in with my finger and then you'll see wet on your finger if it is leaking. This one's good, it's dry. There is another problem here and I think it's the radiator. So we may have to replace that. That's collateral damage with the flush. So we'll go around and we'll bleed everything. I want to start with the radiator nearest the boiler. Well, after bleeding, I'll have to have a secondary check for leaks. Um, it's tedious, but I tend to believe it's indeed necessary. So we'll just get the boiler up to the correct pressure, one and a half. And we'll fire up the heating. So we have an unfortunate leak on this radiator. And this being a repair channel, I'm going to attempt to repair. Given that these radiators were originally welded at the factory, I would consider that to be an acceptable repair. And I think the leak is actually just there, just above my finger. That's where the stained water was running off. So I think it could well be acceptable just to fill that crack there with a good bead of weld. I don't want to be blowing through. So we've now got the recently repaired radiator back on the wall and hopefully the repair will last, but you never quite know. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some central heating inhibitor to the system. And as this radiator is empty, um, it's a good candidate to add that to. So we can normally add it to a towel rail, they give easier access, but in this particular house there isn't one. So I've got a 3 8 adapter on my ratchet, and that just fits nicely in there to remove. It was actually a lot tighter than that, but it's pre-loosened. And I have one hose pipe, so I'm going to put the end in that radiator now it's just a short length pipe this and it's going to the funnel so we could pour the uh, inhibitor straight in the funnel and it will make its way into the heating system so with the inhibitor now in we can now top up the system pressure bleed the rads etc Unfortunately the dreaded drip has returned, it's perhaps failed in an area I'm suspecting where it's difficult to get the welding tackle in, which is a shame, but um, there you go, that's life. Well at least we've got everything done, uh, the good news is the hot water seems to get round the radiators quicker than ever, that's a, a notable change, and I think perhaps if I were to do this again, I think I'd probably put the... Uh, sludge inhibitor in just to loosen a few things up before I started you know and let it circulate for a, a good few weeks and let it let it work its magic the very next job I'm going to do is I'm going to get up there and uh, clean out the, the magnetic filter so many thanks for watching and why not subscribe to learn of more low-cost repair solutions